The new roundabout's about to be built, and we're going to go learn about it from John O'Keefe, Lee Crone, and Todd, the engineer from Stantec. Let's go in. I'm at the town hall with Lee Crone and Todd Duguay, and we're here to talk about the new roundabout project, which is going to start in about a month. Is that correct? That's our hope. That's yes. it. Lee, can you tell us about the history of Malfunction Junction, or would you sure. prefer to call it something else? Well, we're going to call it Center Bridge, okay. which is really its historical, historically correct name. Uh, this intersection has been a choke point in the center of town for a long, long time. In fact, if you read the history of Manchester from 1761 to 1961, it talks about traffic jams in the center of town. But in those days, it was a horse and a buggy getting stuck in the mud and not the... the, you know, the grand amount of tourism traffic that we've often witnessed there. But it's long been a choke point in the center of town, and it became the cause of denial of a number of development projects in the 80s and the 90s based on the perception or reality of traffic impact. And yet, as a community, we came to realize that if we wanted to keep the commercial core viable and keep development in the core where it belonged, we had to find a better way than just saying no because otherwise it puts pressure on the edges of town, which we as a community clearly wanted to avoid. So in the early 90s, through a federal law known as Ice-T, money became available for communities to do transportation-related studies. And we launched into that right away and then formed what's called the Transportation Initiative Committee led by Ron Mancini. And we quickly realized that we couldn't just talk about roads in a vacuum without having a clearer sense of community vision, community values. So we backed off, went through a vision process back in the early 90s, came to a fair amount of consensus about what this community wanted to be, and then based on that, we launched the question of what to do about traffic issues in the center of town. And what that really helped was transforming the question from just talking about motor vehicles to talking about people. And how could we help the center of town become a much more viable and pleasant place for human beings, those of us who live here, work here, and visit here? And then how do we fit motor vehicles into that context? So we looked at all sorts of ideas, all sorts of questions. Then we were faced with the proposed expansion of what was then Grand Union, now Shaw's, and the High Ridge Plaza project across the street. We had to do something about that intersection with Equinox Terrace Road. Grand Union offered to build a traffic light. And we said, no thanks, we don't want more traffic lights in the center of town. Then they offered to widen the road and put in a turning lane. And we didn't want a three-lane road through the center of town. We have one of those known as Depot Street, and not everyone's universally happy with that. At that point, we'd gone through a fair amount of community dialogue, and a roundabout had surfaced as an idea that might be a great idea. This was a great location to try one because it didn't involve moving mountains and rivers. And if it really didn't work, you could take it back out. So we asked the development proponents to build us a roundabout because we thought that was a great idea for calming traffic but still keeping it moving and making it safer for pedestrians. So long story short, that roundabout was built in the mid-90s. A lot of skeptics at first, understandably, much experience in Europe with these, very little in the United States. And most people's experience with, with, was with higher speed, larger rotaries, like the ones in Massachusetts or New Jersey. So <laughs> it got built, the skeptics came around, and fast forward to today, it's been deemed a grand success. It does exactly what we wanted it to do. And that was part of what gave us the courage to move forward after many, many community discussions about ideas for the junction to put a roundabout at that location. So we've been working on this for 
close to 20 years from initially revisiting the whole issue of transportation and traffic in the heart of town, revisiting our development regulations and how to make better use of land and how to fix these intersections for the long haul. Part of the challenge has been the double offset intersection with Bonnet Street. There's very little space between Bonnet Street and, and the junction. So traffic ties up rapidly, backs up onto Bonnet Street, which we've all witnessed, backs up onto Main Street, backs up down Depot Street. Again, the notion with the roundabout is that motor vehicles can just navigate through there calmly in any direction, and that pedestrians only have to cross one lane of traffic at a time. In a normal intersection, cars or people have to wait for it to be clear in both directions, and that rarely occurs, as we've all witnessed. In this manner, motor vehicles only have to watch because it's a one-way flow. So you only need an opening in one direction. Pedestrians, if they need to, have an, a refuge in the middle of each of these crosswalk areas. So if they need to, they can cross partway and stop. But again, the other aspect of this that works so brilliantly is it just calms traffic. It slows it down, but it keeps it moving gently rather than trying to speed your way through an intersection. Many people were worried that there were going to be all sorts of accidents, as if no one knows how to drive their cars in, other than straight lines. The research universally demonstrates that, intersect, that accidents at roundabouts are dramatically reduced compared to stop signs or traffic lights. And if there are accidents, they're very, very low speed and virtually no damage or no injury because you can't drive fast. And if you do have an accident, you hit someone at an angle. So the injury rate tends to be almost zero and the damage rate to motor vehicles tends to be zero. You don't have somebody zipping through what's supposed to be a red light or jumping out of a stop sign and not seeing somebody coming. So that's 20 years of history. Can you tell us about the, the utility lines? Some are going to be underground, some are going to be backlotted? Yes. As a part of that broader community dialogue about road work, we started to look at other types of infrastructure that might need to be replaced or reworked while we're digging things up. So one aspect of it, and I'll get to the overhead in just a minute, relates to underground water and sewer lines. If we're going to dig up Historic Main Street, there's a 100-year-old water line in there, one of the oldest lines in town. Let's replace that while we're digging things up and double up on the traffic control, the disruption, the repaving, and do it once for a lifetime. There's some sewer line work on Main Street and sewer line work on Depot Street down to roughly the Sirloin Saloon area. Again, if we're going to dig up the roads, let's fix what's underground while we've got it dug up so when we replace it all, it's hopefully done for a lifetime. Then we started talking about overhead utilities. And although they become part of the landscape, there's an awful lot of visual clutter above ground. If you actually stop on Main Street or at the junction and look up, there's a lot of junk overhead. Power lines, utility lines, we've got metal strain poles for the blinking light in the middle of the intersection. We realized if we're going to get rid of the blinking light because we no longer need it, what else can we get rid of? And can we find a way to move these overhead utility lines out of public view? So typically the discussion goes from overhead to underground. Logical approach, it literally and figuratively gets it out of view. It's very, very, very expensive to do that. We realized that in many cases we could move the lines off on side streets or behind buildings and accomplish the same goal of getting it out of public view, but at a much less expensive approach. It actually makes the power company a lot happier because they'd much prefer to maintain lines above ground mm -hmm. than below ground. So, for example, instead of all these power lines coming up Depot Street, we've got all sorts of power poles and lots of overhead lines in front of the town green. We're going to run them up Cottage Street and out Wyman Lane. So we put them onto very small, lightly traveled side streets and get it out of the intersection. We're going to re there's a giant pole in this area on hand motors that holds all sorts of utilities. That's going to be able to go away because we're getting rid of the lines in this area and we're going underground through the Morrow's driveway off of Bonnet Street and underground through hand motors to tie back to create recreate the loop. So we're going to get rid of the overhead lines throughout this whole immediate intersection area. 
it's really a two-phase project. We can only afford to do phase one right now. Phase two would be continuing up historic Main Street and moving all the power lines back behind the buildings, running it across the river from the town green up behind the, the bank mm -hmm. building and the, old, and the Thai Basil restaurant. Phase one is designed as a plug and play to phase two. So if and when we can afford to do phase two, much of the prep work's been done and we don't have to spend money to undo things in order to redo them later. So we have four utilities involved. We've got CVPS, the electric power company, Fairpoint with telephone, Comcast with cable, and a company called Level 3, which handles fiber optics. They've all worked with us. They're all on board. They're all working together with us on this to get the job done. It's, it's an incredible process to get to this point today. There were easements to be acquired, rights, land to be acquired. We had to negotiate with constellation of landowners in the immediate project vicinity. So when you get to the land issues, the road issues, the river issues with the bridge, the overhead utilities, the underground utilities, it really became a three-dimensional chess match to try to keep all of this moving forward on a parallel track and manage all of the moving pieces. It's been a fascinating challenge. I bet. How, what is the project's timeline? Do you know when it will start? Uh, it will start as soon as possible, probably May 1st, um, and it's a two-year project. So okay. by November of uh, 2013, it should, should be wrapped up. Can you tell us how the traffic will be affected during the construction? The traffic should be very minimally impacted. Um, we are requiring the contractor to do the majority of his work at night. Um, there will be two lanes of traffic throughout the day time periods. Um, there may be a few uh, parking spaces here or there um, taken up for whatever reason. Um, the contractor can't get everything up to passable levels um, by daybreak. Um, so a, a few things here or there, um, but there should be very minimal impact um, to the traveling public. Lee, I've heard some wonderful things about the design, some things you guys have really planned on. The, um, mm -hmm. the, the railing above the wall, uh, where the pedestrian area is. Can you tell us about that? Sure. I'm glad you asked because that's another key piece of the puzzle that took a fair bit of time to work through, but in the end will be well worth the effort. And again, this began as a road project, fix an intersection quickly became transformed into a downtown improvement project. This community cares a lot about how it looks and how it feels, and that's absolutely worthwhile because it's a big part of what makes a place worth caring about. So we looked long and hard at sidewalk design, crosswalk design, the type of light poles that are going to be used in this project area, bridge railings. We didn't just want plain concrete walls, replacing the <coughs> highway-style steel barrier that exists today. So the new railing around the bridge, if you will, will be partly concrete, but with inset panels to give it some texture, some granite facing on the vertical columns or bollards so that it looks really nice, and then the upper portion of it will be decorative cast iron railing so that it looks and feels like something that belongs in the heart of a historic district. It isn't just a highway project through the middle of town. The street lights will be anodized black historic looking street lights, so they'll look really nice, but they're going to be LED lights, so they'll be the most energy efficient lights available. And since we're paying the electric bill, that benefits all of us as long as those lights exist. They'll also be designed to have electric plugs in them, so if we want to put holiday lights or other decorations <laughs> on there, there's an easy way to do it. The sidewalks and the crosswalks throughout the project area will primarily be dyed, stamped concrete. So it will look like brick, but have the benefit of being a solid pour of concrete so that maintenance is minimized and it's as easy to maintain as a regular sidewalk, but looks a whole lot nicer. So throughout much of the area and in areas like this where there's a broader little pedestrian walkway in front of the mountain goat, that'll all be dyed red, stamped concrete. Crosswalks similarly will be dyed red. And the advantage of doing it that way, again, it creates a very clear visual signal to pedestrians that that's where they should be, and to motorists that there might be pedestrians there. 
the mountable area here in the sort of in the middle of the roundabout will be dyed, but more of a slate gray. Because <coughs> that's an area where the big trucks back wheels ride over. And that way, if the tires kind of skid over that, it doesn't show as much, and it delineates that as a motorist area, not a pedestrian refuge. The middle of it will be beautifully landscaped, and again, we'll have a historic style light in there, similar to the roundabout we have by the supermarket today. So considerable time and effort went into designing this as a real improvement to the community, and not just a road project. We really wanted this to look good for generations. And um, even as far as traffic safety concerns, this is required guardrail to keep the motoring public safe. This is not just your standard uh, shiny steel guardrail. Um, it's a much more matte, box, smaller box beam rail that will fit um, much better with um, what it's going to look like um, when we're done. And um, all the way up Main Street, um, on both sides, it's, it's going to look exactly like it does today. Um, only newer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and um, that was huge because we managed to get the state and the federal government to come along with us that we couldn't just stop right at the intersections. You really needed to tie this in and integrate it into the historic district. So the reality is when we're done, there's a dramatic amount of improvement that otherwise would have had to be funded by solely by the community because many of these sidewalks need to be repaired anyway. It's not cheap, I can tell you, having just gotten some estimates on another piece of the puzzle that we're going to do with town money. Crosswalks will also become ADA compliant for accessibility where they are not today. This crosswalk, for example, can be brought back closer to the bookstore and the cafe and the church where human behavior indicates that's where people will actually go. But today it's not legally compliant, nor is this one between the Mountain Goat and the Baptist Church. So all sorts of incremental improvements that are important and necessary are all being integrated into this project. And the smaller roundabout, um, fully mountable, will match the outer uh, ring of the, the larger run. Great. So it really is going to be a downtown improvement. Absolutely. Yes. Without uh, a I doubt. want to stress that, I think. Yes. It doesn't mean there won't be challenges, right. as there always are. Again, as Todd noted, we're doing our best to minimize impact on the community. When people hear that we're putting it out to bid for night work, they say, wow, good for you. It worked great when we did the paving project at night based on our request of the state some years back. Understanding that creates other sorts of impacts, but it's so much more efficient that our engineers at Stantec told us we could take months off the construction timetable, shortening this from what would feel like a three-year project into a two-year project. Oh, okay. Because it's Good. so much more efficient. You can imagine if the workers don't have to stop every two minutes to let cars go by, mm -hmm. and they can get their work done so much more efficiently. Some of the work may well happen during the day that's outside of the road, or the utility work might happen during the day. The bridge work that's out of the road can happen during the day. Maybe the chosen contractor will put two shifts on and really accelerate, and we don't know yet. But the goal is maximize efficiency, minimize impact as much as possible to businesses, residents, and visitors. We're going to have a full-fledged information campaign to let people know every day if they want to know what's going on, what's happening today, what's happening tonight. We're keeping the public safety community well informed because as you might imagine, if we've got to roll fire trucks into the middle of town, we need to know what, what the day's route might be. Right. We also got the state and the federal government to agree to fund the public information officer. Very unusual approach mm -hmm. to a project of this nature. But we needed somebody who knows the community, whose feet are on the ground, and can keep everyone informed all the time, real time. If, somebody, just, if somebody wanted to be on that information list, how do they, how do they get on They it? could let me know. They can let Tricia Hayes know who is that person. And we plan to have a constant contact approach. So there'll be daily emails if people want. We'll have updates on the Facebook page. We will try to keep everybody informed about detours or alternate routes during various aspects of the project. But we really want to be very helpful and informative 
as much as people would like us to be. Great. And that's all part of this approach that these normally these transportation projects are handled by the state, by VTrans. There's an option for what's called a local transportation facility approach where the town manages the project. And that was the approach we chose many years ago because we felt it was a way for us to maintain more control over all aspects of this, from engineering to design, getting it through to construction. So we've been managing this. That's why we were involved in negotiating easements and rights of way where normally the state would have done that. That fell to me to mm -hmm. manage and negotiate. And we, thanks to the collaboration of many landowners in the center of town, we got it done and we're where we are today. Great. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. And next, I had the pleasure of speaking with John O'Keefe, the town manager of Manchester. So we opened the bids today at 11 o'clock. We had two bidders, which was less than we expected. Um, probably a couple reasons. I mean, now that we've opened them, I think we can talk a little bit about it. A lot of the people who pulled plans, as they call it, which means you, you paid um, uh, the company that's handling the bid documents, you pay them a, a fee to, to get a copy of the plan so you can put together your bid specs and pricing. Um, a lot of those were up north, up in Burlington. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would be a tough travel down here. Uh, so the two companies that we uh, got bids from, uh, the first one was Murkowski Excavating, which is out of Florence, Vermont. And they've done work down here before. They did Cast Terrace, a water main for us. And they also did Elm Street Extension, so the part of Elm Street beyond the, the radio station up and back over the hill. They put in a, a water line for us through there. So they've had some Manchester experience they were the second high bidder, or the second low bidder. Now, the first one was out of Boston Spa, just out of, outside of uh, Saratoga Springs, and that was uh, W.M. Schultz. Uh, so at this point, we'll go back um, to our engineers, which is Stantec. They'll analyze the bids and make a recommendation to us um, so you don't award the bid the first time. Uh, there's not a lot of latitude for the town um, in selecting a bidder for this project. Um, in fact, the state doesn't have much... Um, really to do with it in the end. It's all federal highway requirements because 100% um, of the roadway construction um, is being funded by the Federal Highway Administration. Um, and that is unique to a roundabout. In most cases, the funding split would be you know 80% federal, 20% state, or 20% local, or 10% state and 10% local. Um, some funded projects are 90% federal. Uh, but it's very unique to have a 100% federally funded project. That comes, uh, former uh, U.S. Senator from Vermont, Jeffords, got language in one of the recent transportation bills that actually makes roundabouts 100% federal. Mm -hmm. um, there are some components that the town has decided to make investments in. For example, uh, the center roundabout, the one that actually goes between Hand Motor and the old Sunglass Hut, um, that um, roundabout will have bollards, uh, granite bollards, which are columns that are about um, uh, about three feet high with, with a chain connecting all the bollards. Inside the circle. Inside the circle that sort of frames out the circle. The inside the circle will be very heavily landscaped. Um, and it also have a, a, a three-head um, LED historic-style streetlight in the middle of it. Um, but the TIC committee and the select board and, and town management really felt that the bollards were important for the look of the roundabout, to make it look finished. So we invested money into that. So that those investments will come out of the roundabout fund which is separate from taxpayer money. These are impact fees that we've been charging over the years for development in that area. Can you tell us about the roundabout fund, the so history of it? The roundabout fund, um, the town had identified a long time ago that we needed to do something with the intersections of Bonnet Street, Main Street, and Main Street, and Depot Street. Um, but we weren't quite sure what that was or when we'd do it. So we charged impact fees to people that had proposed development that would be sending traffic into the intersection that was already dysfunctional. Hmm. So over the years, um, hand motor paid money, um, uh, the out designer outlets paid money, um, uh, the High Ridge Plaza development paid into the fund. So at this point, um, we've used the, the, the junction fund to fund the town's 10% share of design because even though um, construction is 100%, design was 90% federal and state and 10% local. So we've been using it to pay for our local 10% share. Uh, the roundabout, the, uh, the right-of-way acquisition, which was fairly significant uh, and amicable, uh, we really worked hard to make sure that we had satisfied all the people that we were going to use their property to build the project. 
that was also 10% local match required. So we were able to use the fund and not taxpayer money to, um, to fund the town's share of that. At this point, we have, about, we have a little bit over $200,000 in that fund. Um, so that will pay for the town's costs in addition to um, what the feds are, are investing in the project. Uh, so how much is the current resident going to be paying? The current resident? A, pre a percentage. Um, in taxes? Or, yeah. Um, nothing at this point. Um, that's the, you know, because it took so long to build the project, we've really been able to build up the financing for it. So um, water and sewer fees over the next couple of years, and we've been doing gradual increase, uh, cost of living increases, so they're, they're very minimal, and we're making sure that we do it slowly. Those will be increased slightly to pay back the bond mm -hmm. uh, for the water and sewer. It really makes sense to do that now. If you don't do it now, it'd be, it'd be foolish. Um, those rates still continue to be um, about average for the state, our water and sewer fees, yet our system is considered one of the best in the state. So at, a, at an average rate, we've been able to maintain a very good system. Um, taxpayer base, um, really no impact at all on the tax uh, on the taxpayer. That's what I was trying to get at. Yes, yeah, and that's, that's the end that. of it. <laughs> yeah, the, I mean, the end story is that the town's general fund, which is really what we get from um, the property tax base is not impacted by the project. Now, a lot of people, I don't think, understand what it is. It is a traffic flow issue. Um, you know, interestingly, as you come up Depot Street, and everybody knows never try to take a left on the weekend, what's interesting is Depot Street, when you look at the traffic counts, Depot Street has a lot more traffic than Main Street. Hmm. There's actually more cars on Depot. So what happens is you've got the main road subordinate to the secondary road. But the secondary road has just enough traffic to make sure you can't pull out when you want to. Uh, so by putting in a roundabout, all four legs, one being the hand driveway, mm -hmm. essentially, the two main street legs and the depot street leg are all pretty equal. Um, normally what happens, though, is that the main road, depot, will be the primary leg of the roundabout. Um, so it, it really will, same thing on Bonnet Street. It'll, it'll also cure the Bonnet Street issue of trying to take a left after school lets out. Um, so I think that's I think that's really going to have an impact. But the the thing that's really above and beyond that is when you look at the details of downtown, you've got a lot of handicap accessibility issues um, in front of the Baptist Church. You've got this sidewalk that's significantly elevated from the actual crosswalk, which means stairs, and stairs are not ADA accessible. But the only answer is leveling everything off. Without a major roadway project, the town taxpayers would be expected to foot those bills. Uh, all the curbing that's tipping out, the sidewalks that are crumbling, all that stuff needs to be improved and replaced. But this is a way to do it at 100% federal funded. But thank you, John. Oh, that's thank you. very informative, and uh, I, I'm all excited about it. I've almost gotten in several accidents trying to go through Malfunction Junction. Yep. And uh, I'm looking forward to it.